Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see every one of you this morning. You know, it is, I don't know if you got any rain here overnight. I think we got enough to get the bottom of the rain gauge a little damp in Manson, so. Which is a good thing. We had two inches over the last week, so. Welcome to our worship service this morning as we, we come together. We're a small but mighty group. Come together to worship God 
and give thanks for the Son, Jesus Christ. This Memorial Day weekend. In Manson, I could tell you who the veterans are, but I don't know who, if there are any veterans here today. Would you raise your hand if you're a veteran? Well, thank you. It's nice to know. Anyway, as we begin, are there any announcement, announcements we need to make, Beth? Any other announcements? Would those who are able please stand as we join in our call to worship? Come. All who, all who need help comes from God, the one who made heaven and earth. Come, all who desire blessing, our blessing comes from God, the God of Abraham and the God of the ages. Come, all who long for salvation, our salvation comes from Jesus Christ, the one sent by God to save the world. Let us pray. God of the ages, we come into this holy space asking for your blessing, only to find that the abundance of your love is already around us. Open our eyes to see the blessing of your creation in the beauty all around us. Open our ears to hear the blessing of your word as it is proclaimed in the story and song on this day. Open our hearts to experience the blessing of faith through the gentle touch of a friend or the supportive smile of a stranger and open our doors that we may become vessels of your blessing to a world still in need of salvation. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join in the singing of our first hymn, The God of Abraham's People.
We are invited to consider how we live as followers of Christ, to look at our decisions and our actions straight on, to hold them up to the example of Christ and to make amends. This time of prayer together, let us look at our lives. Let us pray together. God of salvation, you shower our lives and our world with love. Yet we too often turn away from your blessing. It's just so easy to complain. There are little annoyances each day, but they pile up into mountains from the curse of our lives. Free us from our unwise choices, O oh God. When we are distracted and confused, redirect our attention to the abundant opportunities to experience your love. Focus our hearts on you that we may choose the blessing of salvation offered us each day through Jesus Christ, whom we pray. God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn it, but that the world might be saved through him. Through the saving love of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven and blessed. Our Old Testament reading can be found in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. The Lord, say, the Lord said to Abraham, leave your land, your family and your father's household for the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and will bless you. I will make your name respected and you will be a blessing. I will, I will bless those who bless you. Those who curse you, I will, I will curse all the families of the earth will be blessed because of you. Abraham left just as the Lord told him, and Lot went, went with him. Now Abraham was 75 years old when he left Haran. Psalms 121, we hear, 
I raise my eyes toward the mountains. Where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. God will let your foot slip. Your protector won't fall asleep on the job. No, Israel's protector never sleeps or rests. The Lord is your protector. The Lord is your shade right beside you. The sun won't strike you during the day, neither will the moon at night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. God will protect your very life. The Lord will protect, will, will protect you on your journeys, whether going or coming, from now until forever from now. In Romans chapter 4, verses 1 to 5, and verses 13 to 17, we hear, we hear these words. So what are, are we going to say? Are we going to find that Abraham is our ancestor on the basis of genealogy? Because if Abraham was made righteousness, because of his actions, he would have a reason to brag, but not in front of God. What does the scripture say? Abraham had, had faith in God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Workers' salaries aren't credited to him on the basis of an employer's grace, but rather on the basis of what they deserve. But faith is credited as righteousness to those who don't work because they have faith in God who makes the ungodly righteousness. The promise to Abraham and to his descendants that he would inherit the world didn't come through the law, but through the righteousness that comes from faith. If they inherit because, because of the law, then faith has no effect and the promise has been canceled. The law bring, brings about wrath, but when there isn't any law, there isn't any violation of the law. That's why the inheritance comes through faith, so that it would be on the basis of God's grace. In that way, the promise is secure for all of Abraham's descendants, not just for those who are related by law, but also for those who are related by the faith of Abraham, who is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have appointed you to be the father of many nations. So Abraham is our father in the eyes of God in whom he had faith. The God who gives life to the dead and calls things that don't exist into, into existence. Our gospel lessons can be found in John chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. There was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a Jewish leader. He came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could do these miraculous signs that you do unless God is with them. Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born in you, it's not possible to see God's kingdom. Nicodemus asked, how is it possible for an adult to be born? It's impossible to enter the mother's womb for a second time and be born, isn't it? Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the spirit, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't be surprised that I said, that I said to you, you must be born anew. God's spirit flows wherever it wishes. You hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. It's the same with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said, how are all these things possible? Jesus answered, you are a teacher of Israel, and you don't know these things. I assure you that we speak about and what we know and testify about what we have seen, but you don't receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has gone up to heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the human one. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the human one be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. God so loves the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world must be saved through him. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Thank you so much for blessing us with your voice and reading these holy words this morning. It's very much appreciated. 
And he just read probably the most famous phrase anywhere in the Bible that we hear constantly. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's not where I'm going this morning. I'm going to go clear back to the beginning of John, John 3. Talk about Nicodemus this morning. Nicodemus was considered a wise man. He was a Pharisee. He was a teacher of the Lord, of the Lord leader in the temple, leader of the Jews, one of, one of the ruling class, one of the special people. Quite possibly a very rich man who commanded who <clears throat> commanded respect because of his position in the temple. A man who knew the laws of Jewish life inside and out, probably even came up with a few of those laws himself. That's the way it was done. Nicodemus, a man who could most likely say anything he wanted. And the people would obey without argument because he represented those in charge of the religious life. Now in today's world, we can probably get a pretty good picture of him. Very large man, a very well-fed man, expensive clothes, surrounded by an entourage wherever he went. People following him, honoring him, asking favors of him, asking his opinion on just how a certain law should be interpreted, trying to be noticed by him for what he could do. And yes, most likely, some of them even worshiping him. Nicodemus was a very important man. But here he was in these verses sneaking around, under the cover of darkness, no less, to come before this man Jesus and ask him a question. He had to know that even by acknowledging this man and his teaching, Jesus, it could get him in big trouble. Even being in the presence of this man who, according to Jewish law, was unclean because of his activities, could cause Nicodemus, at the very least, to be unclean himself and need to undergo the ritual cleansing. Yet, in his mind, there was something so important, something so inviting, so curious, so exciting going on around this man. Man, Jesus, Nicodemus, he, he just, just couldn't resist. He had to go see what this was all about. Something he just had to know. Something eating at his very core. Something that drove him to risk everything. His job, his reputation, even possibly his life, just had to see. He had to talk to this man, Jesus, and see what it was all about for himself. Well, from the very first statement we hear, Nicodemus is in trouble. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. What an acknowledgement. What an admission. You can almost see Nicodemus quaking in his shoes at even the very thought, admitting right off the bat that Jesus was more important, better connected than he, a Pharisee, a leader, and a teacher was. Now, he may have been trying to trap Jesus into something. We don't know, but it doesn't sound like that. Nicodemus knew of what he spoke because he had seen the signs. He had seen what Jesus was doing among the people. He had heard of the great and wonderful things Jesus was accomplishing. And he knew that no one else could do these things except one who was from God. And Jesus replies in a somewhat, at least for the time, a nonsensical manner. He gives an answer that seems to make no sense at all. He says, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus asked the, nat the natural following question, how can someone being born again after growing old? Perfectly logical question in most people's minds for someone whose life experiences is strictly one of that of natural life here on earth. Jesus replies, you, Nicodemus, and I are speaking of 
two entirely different things, two entirely different worlds. You speak and think strictly of the concrete, those things which you can touch, those things which you can feel, while I speak of those things which you must take completely on faith alone. You speak and think strictly of things in this world of which you know, while I speak of things not of this world, but of the kingdom of God, which you cannot yet possibly know. Oh, the things I will teach you, the things I will show you, but first you must be clean and pure as the day you were born. I'm not talking physically, I'm talking spiritually. You must be open to accepting of that which you do not know, that which you cannot control, that which you cannot see. You cannot control, see, or know where the wind comes from, but you know physically when you hear it. You must do the same in your spiritual life if you want to know me. Now you can almost see the look on Nicodemus's face, that look of, what are you talking about? That look of, I have no clue what you're talking about. That look of, I hear what you're saying, but you're not making any sense. But Jesus pays him no mind. He keeps, he goes on and he, he keeps right on talking, laying it out in front of Nicodemus, putting it right out there for him, giving examples, hoping that somehow, some way, something will sink in. And maybe, just maybe, Nicodemus will understand. Finally, in exasperation, Jesus just looks at him and says, how dense can you be? You don't understand. If you haven't figured out what I've just put in front of you that you can see, just how do you expect to understand that which you can't see? Just isn't going to happen. If, you sm if I smack you up alongside the head with a stick and you, don't feel it, you still don't feel the pain, just how can I expect you to feel it if I just wave an imaginary stick at you and tell you that I just hit you? You, Nicodemus, are supposed to be a teacher. But how can you teach what you simply do not understand? If after all these years of teaching the law and the prophets in the temple, you still haven't figured out what I told you, you haven't figured out just who I am, it won't do any good to try and prove it to you further. Stop trying to overanalyze this. Clear your mind of what you know and accept that which you do not. Read the scriptures you teach. I am he. I am the one you taught about. I am the son of God, and I have been sent by him to bring you and all who believe eternal life. All too often in our lives and world today, we find ourselves much like Nicodemus, questioning those things which were right in front of us. So overanalyzing the obvious that we miss the hidden meaning which is really the entire point of the whole thing. As the old saying goes, you can't see the forest for the trees. What it comes down to is a simple matter of faith. You can't see it. You can't taste it. You can't touch it. Although some say that you can feel it, not as a physical touch, but as something inside of your very being, you simply have to believe. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Believe that he is the only path to eternal life. To believe that through him, we'll all be with God one day. Jesus came into this world as a little baby, lived, breathed, and grew. Fullness of time he taught and died and rose again for us, that we might have the faith to believe. We will leave this place, go out into his world and spread God's word because we have the faith to believe. Glory, praise, and honor be to his name. Let us stand 
and join our voices once again in our next hymn, Christ Beside Me. Please be seated. You threw me, Beth. I threw myself. <laughs> I know that tune, but not to those words. <laughs> well, whatever in there gave me was not what was in the <laughs> hymnal, so I apologize. <laughs> it's still a hymn praising God, right? Yep. Yes. Everything works. We already had uh, announcements. Are there any joys and concerns that, that we need to? Think about this morning. Buddy ill or in the hospital or in need of our prayers. Joy that Scott and Beth Gall are new grandparents. Kinzer and Gall. Her name is Kinzer Ann. I have to ask because I've got a granddaughter named Kinsey. All their kids start with a K, so you never know. Anything else? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts for gathering us together in fellowship, come together and worship and praise your name. We celebrate this weekend 
what we call Memorial Day, and we celebrate the service of all our military members. Yet it's not just for them who hold a special place on our hearts, it's for all those loved ones who have gone before, who now rest in your loving arms. We ask your blessing this morning on, on Kinzer, joins a family new to this world. May she come to know and to love your name as much as we do. We ask your blessing on each and every one of us. We thank you. Even though it's slowing down some of our progress, as farmers, we know that the rains are welcome. We know that the rains are part of life. Dealt with them before, and we will again. We ask your blessing on each and every one as we go about the work that you have assigned each and every one of us each and every day. All this we ask in our Father's name. Let us join together in our Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power. Bread of the Bernanner. And now comes the time in each and every service where we acknowledge our blessings from God. Through this invitation to share our gifts, we acknowledge that God has blessed us abundantly, that we are to be a blessing to his world. In the very act of giving, in every act of bestowing blessings on one another, we find that we are blessed yet again. I encourage you now to enter fully into this amazing cycle of blessing. Let us pray together our prayer of dedication. Generous God, you shower us with gifts, including the greatest gift of all, your own Son, Jesus Christ. In thanksgiving and praise, we offer you our time, our money, our very selves. In these actions, we proclaim our intention to be a blessing. In our parting hymn this morning, we are God's people. Thank mm -hmm.
Go forth, having heard the call of the Holy One. Go forth, loved by the Creator, Redeemer, and Companion. Go forth, strengthened by the Sender, the Sent, and the Spirit. Receive the gift of new birth and eternal life. Testify to these things. Enter the kingdom of God. Thank you. 